Hello everyone and welcome to AI Chihuahua, or why machine learning is dogged by failure and delays. My name is Ian Halstrom and I'm the product manager of Captain Day 2 IQ's end-to-end -end machine learning platform for enterprises. I spent the last decade in companies such as Spotify, Bosch and CFO rummaging through immense data sets and applying machine learning to improve products, decisions and processes. In that time, I've come to appreciate what many others in the ML space have also learned the same hard way. Machine learning is relatively easy compared to the operations of machine learning. That's not to say that building machine learning models is trivial. There's just a lot more to it than what is often thought of when people hear artificial intelligence, machine learning, or data science. After this talk, I hope you too will have a better appreciation of the unique challenges in ML in the enterprise. But first, who, beside me, says ML in the enterprise is hard? Gartner states that 80% of AI projects will remain alchemy for the foreseeable future. VentureBeat notes that 87% of data science projects never make it to production, and that it can take up to three months to get a single model into production. That's neatly summed up in a tweet I can vouch for from my own experience. It's not uncommon for ML models to take up to a year to reach production. Quite frankly, that's insane. And yet there's the clear disconnect between the realities of enterprises and an O'Reilly survey where more than half of the respondent companies say they are mature in their adoption of AI technologies, although most of it happens in R&D. That is not in production, production settings where one-offs are not good enough. So how did we arrive at today's technologies, techniques, and troubles? End-to-end -end machine learning platforms for the big data era have only emerged over the last five, maybe 10 years at companies such as Google, Facebook, Netflix, and Uber. The big data era kicked off more or less with Hadoop and MapReduce in the early noughties, soon followed by Kafka and Spark. Around the same time, the first frameworks for deep learning were developed, Torch, Theano, and Deep Learning for J, a framework for the JVM. Keras and TensorFlow emerged in 2015. Back then, TensorFlow was very low level, even though nowadays it includes the Keras API. PyTorch came a bit later. It relied on Torch's core, but replaced Lua with Python, which is the de facto language for data science, although R remains popular in research circles too. In terms of ML platforms, Facebook was the first tech company to publicly announce details of their ML platform, FB Learner Flow. That was followed by Twitter and Google who published the details of TFX or TensorFlow Extended, which has since become the backbone of deployments in many production environments containing TensorFlow. Uber's Michelangelo was announced in late 2017, which gained a lot of attention at the time as it inspired many others to reveal the details of their platforms. Kubeflow popped up in 2018. Earlier this year, the first major release of Kubeflow came out. After that came Airbnb's Big Head and then Netflix with their notebook-based MetaFlow platform that has since been open sourced, but is still intimately tied to AWS infrastructure. LinkedIn followed suit, as did eBay and Spotify, who mostly run Kubeflow pipelines on GCP with their own Luigi for dependency management. Lyft open sourced their Kubernetes platform called Flight earlier this year, and Intuit recently discussed details of their ML platform too. As you can see, end-to-end -end ML platforms for the big data era have only been out there for five years or fewer. When we talk about developing machine learning models, most people agree on what's meant, the training of an algorithm based on data. The algorithm is nowadays often, but not always a neural network. But there is much more to ML than just the model itself. You need to ingest, and verify data after which you can extract features that power the model itself. The model requires debugging and you have to evaluate and analyze it for bias and fairness. Once the model is ready to be served, it requires infrastructure of its own with monitoring, of course. 
The overall process needs to be managed, the data and model need to be tracked, and there are of course generic components such as resource management, configuration management, and automation to make all the magic happen with as little as possible human intervention. All in all, as little as 5% of all production ML systems is the code to train the machine learning model. As I said in the beginning, there's more to it than what most people think about when they hear ML, especially in the enterprise. These tasks you see here are usually split over a data scientist, a data engineer, and a machine learning engineer. The data engineer's main focus is on ETL, extracting, transforming, and loading data. This means integrating with lots of data sources and writing custom transformations to shape the data in the format required for each use case. Machine learning engineers are typically responsible for ML models in production environments, dealing with web services, latency, scalability, and handling most of the automation around ML. Well, there certainly is a large infrastructure component that can often be handled by DevOps or platform engineers. The challenges unique to machine learning mean in practice that they need to have a solid background in modeling too. We'll see some of these challenges in a little while. Data scientists then sit in the middle of this and they are the experts on data sets and the value of these data sets to the business. A core task of a data scientist is the identification of business problems that can be solved by data science and in a lot of cases, machine learning. In quite a few organizations, data scientists can often be heard complaining about data engineers being too slow in providing high quality data sets that they can use for their models. They, in their defense, often counter that it takes time to access the correct data, build the pipelines that are well tested, parameterized, and automated to run on a schedule with clear SLAs, and of course, monitoring and alerting in place. The same is actually true for the handover of models towards machine learning engineers who deal with the production aspects of the models. They often have to rewrite the data ingestion and even model code, which can add or even uncover mistakes that cause the models to be delayed or fail completely. While there's definitely some overlap with data and machine learning engineers, the tools that data scientists use are quite different too. While both groups of engineers on the left and right of this picture are comfortable with IDEs, CICD containers, and the like, data scientists, due to the nature of their work, often rely on notebooks for exploratory work with little to no automated testing or containerization. Let's now work through an example of how we can arrive at some of the necessary components for a machine learning platform by reasoning from a high level business objective. For that, I want to introduce you to Canines, an online shop for dogs run by dogs. The K9 CEO states to the executive team that she wants to increase online sales by 10% without changing marketing strategy or budget. Discussions with the CMO had already revealed that K9s leave their mark everywhere in town, so it doesn't make sense to adjust their strategy or expand their reach. Immediately, the CTO jumps in and says they could build a recommendation engine to suggest items customers may be interested in. The CEO loves the idea and wants the CTO to work out the details with the team to figure out what they need to make that happen. Here's a quick design um, of what they intend to build. The CTO starts the discussion with the team. Well, with 100,000 products in our catalog and many of them seasonal, such as our summer bestseller, How to Bark in French, we cannot rely on manual curation. We therefore have to look at automation and ideally leverage our customer data. The data scientist concurs. I propose a collaborative filtering recommender. It is a decent baseline to, that does not require special product knowledge, so there's no need for extensive feature engineering. We can use existing data of our users' behavior, such as clicks, page views, and purchases. For seasonal products, we may need to look at a hybrid approach that combines a collaborative filtering recommender with a content-based recommendation system though. To achieve that, we need a platform that's capable of running many models and experiments on large amounts of data in an interactive manner. That means storing the data in a format that's easy to consume, the data engineer adds. 
We must grab it from wherever it arrives, including external data sources and maybe even social media to pick up on trends for seasonal items. That requires ingestion, transformation, cleansing, storage, dealing with dependencies, etc. None of that works, the ML engineer says, if you cannot deploy the models automatically while ensuring the quality doesn't drop. We have to be able to run the deployed and a baseline model in parallel. Moreover, the redeployed models should always be safe to serve. That is, it should not crash, it should not behave in unexpected ways or increase the latency to above our internal SLAs. The infrastructure engineer summarizes it for the team. That sounds like at least observability across components such as data pipelines, model deployments. Am I missing anything? <coughs> Excuse me. Feedback loops. Huh? Ask the infrastructure engineer. The ML engineer explains, suppose our website is experiencing technical issues that increase the latency to the point where individual pages load over several seconds instead of fractions thereof. This causes our customers to abandon the website and look elsewhere. We therefore receive less data to determine what they and others are interested in. This in turn means the model may deteriorate over time due to a lack of signals, which in turn causes the recommendations to become worse. If the recommendations become less relevant to our customers, they will not click on as many items as before from the ones we suggest, which means the data itself goes down the tube. That will make the model's recommendations even worse and so on. In other words, a feedback loop. Worst of all, without proper monitoring and alerting, this is a failure mode that is completely silent. I see the infrastructure engineer thinks. So we need to monitor, monitor model performance, system performance, and data and model drift. Indeed, for the initial development, the data scientist proposes, we can restrict ourselves to daily battery training of the model and not attempt to retrain it dynamically with live data. Daily fresh recommendations should be good enough to begin with. However, the retraining has to run automatically and with safety guards in place. If the data feeding our model is incomplete, late, or even incorrect, we have to alert the team and delay automatic retraining until upstream issues have been addressed. Ah, so a deployment is not simply a model behind a REST API. It's really a multi-step workflow of data pipelines, their dependencies, schedules, or triggers, the code to train the model, the model once it's been trained and is ready for serving, the code to decide how and when to deploy, and of course, an orchestration layer that makes sure all of this is done automatically and in case of issues, knows how to deal with each. Not to mention, of course, observability and the ability to scale as our business grows. On top of which, the ML engineer continues, we need to track lineage from all inputs and configurations to the output artifacts of the trained model. We need to be able to tell our customers why they saw a certain recommendation and to do that reliably, we need to ensure they can go back in time in case we need to ensure we can go back in time in case something went wrong. The infrastructure engineer then asks whether they can approach the problem with a Git based CI CD. Both the data and machine learning engineers say yes but only if they see deployments as entire workflows, not individual steps. In ML, you typically deploy the code that builds, optimizes, and deploys the models itself. In a sense, we deploy the factory, not merely the finished product. Unit and integration tests are pretty standard for data pipelines and microservices. And with metrics or counters, you can also ensure that some basic sanity checks are done before storing the derived data sets to deal with the most obvious issues that the data scientist also previously mentioned. However, some of the steps in ML are harder to test with CI. Model training and tuning are statistical in nature. And of course, the data distributions change naturally with customer behavior. After that, the data scientist cautions the team further. If a certain model is performing better than a baseline, it does not automatically imply measurable improvements in KPIs. 
The ML and engineer understands the problem. As long as we honor APIs and SLAs, we should be able to exchange models without having to go through formal approval processes. That implies we must ensure ready to serve models are safe and good enough. We have to do canary deployments, gradual rollouts and automated AB tests for each deployed model by default. Woof, the infrastructure engineer box when thinking of all the list of technologies that need to be supported. I'm only one canine, so I have to insist on a platform that I can operate with ease that suits our tight security requirements, supports multi-tenancy with access to shared resources, etc. I'm thinking container orchestration. I personally don't care what runs inside those containers, but I do care about my budget and not spending inordinate amounts of time going through dozens of manuals whenever there's an issue. Kubernetes is an obvious choice. With cloud native technologies, we can leverage the latest in scalability and high availability to serve our customers with minimal or no downtime at all. That should make my boss happy too. While the data and machine learning engineer are fine with that, the data scientist pauses. I'll have to see what tools are available for Kubernetes. The ML ecosystem grew independently of the cloud native stack. So some of it depends on Jupyter notebooks and virtual environments and other bits run on Hadoop, Yarn or Mesos. Not all of the tools are built for large distributed workloads where failure is common and recovery from failure is expected. Anyway, so the team goes on their merry way having identified at least a decent amount of the tools they need based on just a high level business objective they were given, a 10% increase in on-platform sales. At this point, you may wonder whether the previous discussion is at all representative of a real team hashing it out. Unfortunately, the answer is no. Our canines were already ahead of many companies in that they knew what they needed. They probably had previous experience build building production ML systems. In reality, monitoring is often an afterthought, as is security, especially with platform and infrastructure engineers not part of the early discussions. It's also not uncommon for companies to skip the infrastructure altogether and just begin with a small project that flies under the radar for a bit and naturally evolves into a Frankenstein's monster of assorted technologies. It's what I, for the purposes of this talk, would like to call the Frankenweenie stack. While an MVP can serve as a valid basis for a future ML platform, few companies take a step back and re-evaluate core infrastructure. Technologies just keep being tacked on based on short-sighted needs, and that can be hazardous to any hair remaining on your head, especially if you're on the infrastructure team. This is often the result of the broken Roomba methodology. In the broken Roomba methodology, teams bump into every possible obstacle due to narrow focus on short-term goals until you either run out of willpower or declare victory irrespective of the actual outcome. The broken Roomba methodology, although methodology is probably too kind of word, lies at the heart of the model hand-me-downs from data scientists to machine learning engineers, where conversations often go along these lines. Hey, it works on my machine. Why is this taking so long? The model was finished ages ago. Well, you know, I've been rewriting the finished model for weeks, thank you very much. I think you get the picture. As we've seen before, some tech companies have successfully built end-to-end -end ML platforms in recent years. They most likely use the broken Roomba methodology too, but given sufficient engineering resources, the broken Roomba methodology can resemble the agile methodology and actually lead to success. It's very easy to underestimate the difficulty of building a machine learning platform from scratch, thinking that most of the problems are already solved one way or another, when in reality, most of the technology is still rough around the edges and built in isolation from the rest of the stack. So how does this all contribute to the 87% failure rate that I mentioned earlier? Well, many so-called data science platforms focus on model training and tuning. That is the pure data science. They leave deployments where you actually see the return on your ML investments as an exercise to the reader. I can't say I blame them because three out of 15 common ML frameworks do not mention anything about serving models in their official documentation beyond how to save and load models for demonstration purposes. 
Of course, many of these frameworks evolved out of research and development, so they did not necessarily have production, us production usage in mind. But that does mean there is no mention whatsoever of what to do with the model once serialized or how you can deploy it, whether that be in a scoring engine or as a web service. That's your problem. You can argue that it's not the training framework's duty to tell data scientists how to use the models in production, but with 87% of ML initiatives ending up in the dumpster, that is simply unacceptable. Particularly since with the right technology, it does not have to be that complicated. With build or buy decisions, it often comes down to an all-in-one platform versus a mixture of best of breed technology. With open source technology, you can actually get the best of everything. So why not roll your own platform based on top-notch tech? The real question is, can you afford to? Sure, open source software is free to use, but you have to invest quite a bit in selecting, introducing, using, and maintaining these technologies. The first step may sound trivial, selecting a stack, right? But let's take a step back and look at the cloud native and AI landscapes to get a better idea of what you're really up against. That's quite a bit, isn't it? Finding the relevant technologies for your business, just the handful that are relevant to you, can take a while. And even then, do you really know you have the best for your use cases and infrastructure? Do you really have the skills and times to create custom components to wire each of these up individually, make them work, and scale at your organization? And of course, maintain the base technologies and the glue code with documentation that does not introduce bus factors of one everywhere. If you're an infrastructure engineer and this is your landscape, do you really know what's best and needed for ML use cases? And if you're a modeling expert with crazy data skills, do you really understand the difference between Kubernetes, Docker and say Conda? Unfortunately, it's not much better in the AI world. On the surface, most product alternatives seem similar enough to be mistaken for identical. Um, in fact, if you've spent some time loitering about in the AI landscape, you may have come across posts about Airflow versus MLflow versus Kubeflow. There's a new article about that almost every week, and yet most seem to miss the point. The overlap between these three technologies, as just an example, is minimal at best, as they are not even competing offerings. But not a lot of people realize that until it's too late. A quick and dirty POC won't be able to tell you much about the relative differences in the long-term usage and integration challenges with other technologies. On the other hand, many detail detailed proofs of concept won't be possible because of time and budget constraints. After all, you were hired to solve business problems with technology, not evaluate technologies full time. If only you did not have to settle for an all-in-one platform that's mediocre at everything and not really great at anything. If only you could have the best of breed platform without the need to dig through thousands of pages of not always that great documentation and out of date tutorials. If only. Let's assume you or our friends over at Canines have already a large Hadoop cluster and you don't feel like moving the petabytes of data around. Let's also assume you manage to choose the following technologies. Kubernetes as the base infrastructure, Argo CD, Kubeflow for end-to-end -end ML, and Kafka, Cassandra, and Spark for data ingestion, storage, and transformation respectively, possibly even feature engineering. You may think you're ready to go, but unfortunately, Kubeflow itself has lots of duplication in its 30 plus components and even gaps, especially when it comes to production environments and day two operations. That applies equally to a DIY Kubernetes setup. For instance, serverless auto scaling with Knative, GPU drivers, authentication, security, cost management, and of course, our old pals, logging, monitoring, and alerting. These are often not included in the base technologies. 
Oh, and whenever there are version upgrades, you need to ensure all stateful services are migrated properly and existing data is not inadvertently wiped. Let's not forget that for a basic setup, you want development, staging, and production clusters. The production cluster must not share any resources with the others, and you may even want to create a split there, production training and tuning versus production serving as they each sport different types of workloads with potentially differing hardware requirements and SLAs. That's already a total of four clusters to manage just for machine learning. Now you need more software and more glue code and more documentation. Beyond that, you've probably also overlooked that the team needs to be trained in these technologies. Ai Chihuahua. Well, the good news is that DKP Day 2 IQ's Kubernetes platform offers all of these components. We offer the best of breed solutions with Day 2 features out of the box, such as Captain, our opinionated end-to-end -end machine learning platform powered by Kubeflow, lifecycle support for all services, including stateful ones, thanks to Kudo, CICD with Dispatch, and best of all, an enterprise-grade platform with security and observability baked into Convoy, our Kubernetes platform. No need to piece everything together by pretending to be a Roomba with faulty navigation. On top of that, we also offer Commander to deal with cluster sprawl. As I already mentioned, there's four clusters to deal with at the very least and Conductor for hands-on training. We actually test all of our products on long running SOAP clusters with mixed workloads to simulate realistic environments. That way you can rest assured it'll work, scale up and not fail on the second step of the installation or when running a tutorial notebook. With our suite, we promise compatibility with the open source editions while giving you the best of what open source and cloud native have to offer. Phew, that was a lot, wasn't it? Well, so let's recap what we've seen and heard today. Many enterprises struggle with going from a machine learning prototype to production, partly because the technologies are not mature yet, partly because many underestimate the complexity of an end-to-end -end machine learning platform. Similarly, we've seen that blindly applying DevOps practices to ML risks missing many of the challenges that are unique to machine learning. The amount of software that's available and needed for machine learning is staggering. And that either leads to vendor lock-in on many fronts or the dreaded Frankenweenie stack. So talk to us if doing ML in 2020 still feels like FML. Feel free to look that one up if you don't know what it means. If you've done ML, you sure know what that feels like. And with that, I thank you for listening.